I'm like freezing up because I'm nervous. That's fine. It wasn't fair to you that I didn't love you as deeply as you loved me and I didn't want the same things that you wanted anymore. And I felt myself growing distant. I felt like it was better that we split up now than have regrets later and go 20 years down the road and realize, wow, this really isn't what I wanted. And it turns out that it really wasn't what I wanted. Summer's coming around But I can't even breathe Yeah, summer's coming around I push over my cubicle Now I can't see I got memories in the backwoods Playing in the forest You were electrocuted by a fence On the ranch and act like it took courage This is my story or at least a story. Not even a very good story to tell you the truth. I'm an introvert after all, so talking is not really my forte. But long story short, I had a setback. Now I'm embarking on a 2600 mile journey from the Mexican border in California to the Canadian border in Washington state to set myself right again. Shake this sense of helplessness and abandonment the only way I know how. By hiking. Because hiking has always acted as a kind of therapeutic proxy for me. There is no antagonist in the storyline, other than the depression I deal with on a daily basis. My ex and I were simply the product of young love. Though, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It still stung like hell. I'm not fooling myself. I'm no Instagram sensation. I'm sure as hell not a professional athlete. My looks don't turn heads and I currently have this blah approach to life. So I'm not sure if anyone is even watching this thing, but in the off chance someone didn't have anything better to do with their Tuesday afternoon, maybe you can take away something out of this. Because we all have our issues, and we all need ways to cope. Maybe this will work, maybe it'll just be a train wreck, but that's all part of the journey. I'm Sean Kennedy, and welcome to the Pacific Crest Trail. or not I've lost my cell phone I dropped it within a, about a two mile radius somewhere so that means if it's at the farthest part that's gonna be four miles out of my way oh my goodness Oof. oh please be it I think I see something Let's see Is that it in the pathway there oh my goodness
So I've been, been told that rock rings, like the one behind me, hold secret magical powers of like teleportation and shit like that. So, I'm not a huge believer in this stuff, but I'm gonna give it a shot. No, you've gone way too far. Now get out of here before you ruin the end of the movie. Someone grab a check and we'll get the fuck out of my tent. Oh, oh it's not coming in there, bro. We gotta take pictures first, hang on. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can hear that, but it is windy as fuck outside. So I had a little bit of trouble with my tent last night. All the stakes broke and the rain fly actually flew off in the middle of the night during a storm. Luckily, like 10 seconds before I threw my rope around my rain fly, tied it off to my tent somehow. And when it blew off, it was like blowing like a freaking flag. And I was able to reel it back in. And I, luckily, I still have my rain fly at my poles. One of them looks like it's broken. Very interesting night, to say the least. Very windy. Probably got like two hours of sleep. But it is what it is. Five. Four, three, two, one. So, can you tell me your name and spell it? My real name or real my name, chill yeah. name? <laughs> can you give me your name and spell it? Sure, uh, like normal name? Normal name, yeah. Okay. My real name? Yeah. My trail name? Oh, your real name. My real name, my other name. <laughs> Do you want my real name or my Your real trail name, name, yeah. <laughs> Vivian Hill. Uh, Xavier Pino. Wu Chan Li. If you care for my, my Christian at the church name. <laughs> <laughs> it's Jeremy Dameron. Eloise Robbins. Can you give me your name and spell it? First and last. Do you need my yeah. middle name too? No. <laughs> okay. Why are you hiking the Pacific Crest Trail? Seems like a good idea at the time. I'm too young to die and too old to give up. Just because you get older doesn't mean that life has stopped. You know, it's like, okay, I, I want to go do something challenging. I want to have something that, you know, I can tell my grandchildren I did that they'll just go, wow, Grandma. I've just been feeling kind of this, like, nagging inside to, like, get out and go do something. Like, I haven't, haven't been camping in a long time, so I was like, there's a trail that goes all the way from Mexico to Canada. <laughs> like that's insane. We, I guess, we kind of have that that history of, you know, we want to go out and explore. We want to go westward and explore, and um, I guess it's just continuing in that like you know frontier spirit, um, and allowing people to have that opportunity, even though you know every inch of the country has been mapped a hundred times over. I think living this kind of lifestyle is something I've always wanted to like not really be tied down and just. To walk all day and um, see new things every single day, sleep somewhere new every day. I came out here to kind of sacrifice mind and body and also bank account um, to come out and have some fun and, 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 and not work, you know, and not just grind like the traditional grind might be. 
personally, I'm not out here trying to find something or, or you know, or be something. I, I mean, the hardest by generally the purest sense of the fucking word, man. Like to walk a lot of miles and 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 to think a lot of thoughts or have none at all. I read in a magazine an uh, article to about two German girls who did it, and I just read uh, they cross the desert, they're going up to the high Sierras, they go to the woods in, uh, in Oregon, and I was thinking, oh fuck, that's the thing I would do. Parents. Friends, every people says you should go to school because you have to get a good job. I mean, it, it is true and it is good, good way, good good pathway. But it is only one. It is not only one pathway. All my vacation time in the past two years was spent backpacking. So I figured if I was going to take a five-month vacation, might as well spend it backpacking. Um, and my job just wasn't working and I'm young and not tied down to anything, so I figured now is a good time to hike. Well, I ain't got no fight left in me anymore. And I'm tired of killing my mind in the trenches this year lovers war and i might as well lie to you babe cause there's no way you'll understand i might as well try to do the very best that i can to pretend i feel really good pretend like i'm Pretend like I'm understood But ain't that the way life's supposed to be? There's a hard way to love And it seems it's the only way you know I'm tired of watching my back all the time Like you're headed for the door And the truth isn't setting me free It's just making me feel like a jerk I try hard not to self-medicate But it's the only thing that works now I know how old Chief Joseph felt when he laid down his guns. My soul is all bent and my spirit is broke, but I am still too proud to run. I'll pretend I feel really good, Lord. Pretend like I'm Pretend like I'm understood, Lord Cause ain't that the way life's supposed to be What has the trail meant for me so far? Yeah, I'm a hard time articulating words this morning right now. That's alright. <laughs> uh, beautifully simple. Yeah. The trail is really a place of simplicity, right? There's, because uh, everything you own is just on your back, you know? And you just wake up, and your only purpose for that day is to just make forward progress. So it really kind of just boils things down. And it's easier to get the things you're after because they're not these grandiose, like, I need this or need that, things you think you need in life. When in reality, you don't really need a whole lot to feel fulfilled. Whenever I hike, I can free from pressure, like social pressure. We have to get a job to live a life with family and with friends. But whenever I hike, I can be free. There's nothing, nothing compares to it. Just to wake up every day and not having to go to work, and your only job is to walk, <laughs> walk, eat, sleep, repeat. I feel, I feel that the trail is like a home to me now, because it is. I'm sleeping on the trail, I'm e eating on the trail, I make friends on the trail, I smile, cry, 
I do everything on the trail, so it is my home. Well, the Pacific Crest Trail, I can't decide if it's actually a trail or if it's just a state of mind. It's helped me like realize how much goodness there is out there and lots of people. Everyone is so willing to help you out here, and I think that's really, really awesome. I lost a lot of faith in people. I saw a lot of people do just like not be kind to each other and, and the trail has restored that a little bit. People out here are just so nice. It like doesn't feel real. It's like instant friendship. It's like these bonds just get formed so quickly rather than like over the course of time. It's just like you have these groups of people all coming together and they're all in this like the same trial. A lot of people ask me like what do you think about it and so forth and so on and what the trail entails and for me personally um, it's a blank. I don't, it's a, it's actually counter of those things. It's not, for me it's almost, it's so primal like I, I get, I don't get wrapped up in thought. I, get, I don't get wrapped up in the physical part of just doing it and then you realize you're just a person doing it and you have many capabilities as a human to do things, interact and all the things that involve being a human but you're not doing any of them. You are literally a stripped down walker. Uh, and I feel like I'm answering that question, but I'm kind of fucked up, so I apologize. The fact that I've been walking all day it just gives me time to think. And most of the time, it's not anything useful. It's just, you know, kind of stupid stuff going on in my head. It seems we are experiencing technical difficulties. We will return you to your scheduled programming after this brief anecdote. Narrated by three of our hikers with one trail story in common. Enjoy. Just before the fire closure, we we took uh, we took a side well, not a side trip. We went up into the Whitewater Reserve. We were camped at Whitewater Preserve, which is maybe eight miles after Ziggy and the Bears, and we were warned by the rangers that you know there's raccoons here. They're pretty. Um, they go after people's food. You should put all your food in the bathroom, and they'll leave you alone. Most of us did, and I've camped in bear country, so I was very like OCD. Like anything that had a scent was going in there. They didn't really warn us that they don't just go for food. They also go for anything that looks like food. I was cowboy camping and I woke up to a raccoon halfway in my backpack. They pulled out like my wallet, my Ziploc bag wallet, uh, my Ziploc map bag had like literal bite marks out of the Ziploc. The guy sleeping next to me is like clanging his poles together and there's a raccoon just like unfazed by it. You'd hiss at them, you'd like bang a tracking pole at them or something and they just keep coming back. The guy said to us, he says, you're just gonna have to punch him in the face. I hear another guy get out of his tent and they, he, the raccoons had dragged his backpack. He left like a bag of trail mix in the front of his pack. They dragged it like 30 feet and just were like wreaking havoc. So like in the middle of the night, all of us are like trying to like reorganize. They went through one guy's pack, gave him a shakedown, bit through all of his dry bags, chewed on his jet boil, the whole works. Yeah, it was hilarious. It was just a really fun night, yeah. <laughs> Not in a good place right now. It is so freaking hot outside. There's a little stream right behind me. I literally, when I got here, crawled. I dunked my head in and there was freaking cigar buds and pieces of trash. But, oh man, I'd do it again. I probably will do it again if I don't find a different area. What's been the most challenging aspect of the trail so oh, far? Mountains. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, the heat in the mountains, especially is, uh, the desert portion of it. It's incredible that, the, you know, from Minnesota, we're not used to this kind of heat and then, uh, you know, day after day, all day long. What's been the hardest aspect of hiking the PCT so far? Uh, the last week. The last week was the hardest because we have to carry so much water. It was so hot. And it's just going up and down. Sometimes it feels like a vertical beach. You're just walking up a beach. Um, there's not a whole lot of water on this trail. So there's times where you have to carry, um, there'll be no water sources for 15 miles, sometimes even 20 miles. Easily the most challenging aspect of the trail so far has been the mental component. Yes, I did get blisters and I was very sore for the first few hundred miles of the trail. But the homesickness, missing my family, people I love. That has been so much more of a crippling aspect of the trail. Actually, before this trip, I didn't know that the love, like, like kind of around me. So I realized, uh, uh, when I realized that, uh, I, f I felt, uh, I, 
I'm gonna, I wanna go to home, so it's kind of obstacle, big obstacle for me. You like lose people constantly. You like get to know people, and then they either hike faster, or you hike faster, or they take a zero or whatever. So you're constantly losing people, which is really tough. Like I've already hiked with someone for a month, and then we parted ways, and it was really tough. Um, so just trying to keep an open mind towards like the flow of people, because it's kind of constant, and like not letting myself feel like I'm behind or like I have to catch up to people because there's constantly different groups of people rolling through and, and not putting that pressure on myself to like conform to any, like it's my hike. So I had some really tough sections in the Sierra. Um, I'm pretty scared of some of the snow passes. Um, I had a bad fall in Alaska a couple years ago. So um, after that kind of getting up every day and being like, oh great, there's a pass. I've heard it's really sketchy. Like I'm gonna get my ice axe, I'm gonna get my micro spikes on and I'm gonna do it even though it terrifies me. I think that's been probably the hardest part and then kind of mentally preparing myself to do it the next day. Dealing with injuries in the slow process of healing and, and becoming stronger. So getting your getting your trail legs is uh, is not a quick process <laughs> at all, you know? It's um, I guess an obstacle just just kind of like having confidence in myself, my own ability to um, to know what I'm doing, I guess. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, just kind of that feeling that maybe you've bitten off more than you can chew sometimes. <laughs> so it's kind of it's quite daunting to set out on something that's you know that long where there's there is a fairly high chance of not succeeding and it. And when you've told everybody back home that that's what you're going to do and you don't want to kind of <laughs> look like a failure. Yeah, so. you, when you come to realize that you're, it's so remote in places that you could disappear and no one would ever find you again. That's probably the biggest challenge. It's testing of yourself. Those are the hardest moments because it's just you, you know. I could quit or I could skip or I can do many things, but I'm eating pecans. <laughs>
Hey guys, um, I wrote something down that I'd like to read for you. Uh, this particular subject is kind of hard for me to articulate, so I thought writing it down would be the best bet. So, um, bear with me on this one. <clears throat> I left my apartment around 2 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. This was about two months after the split, and my head just wasn't in the right place. I had been crying myself to sleep most nights. I felt abandoned and alone. I was working a, I was working a seasonal job in Yellowstone, about 1,500 miles away from home, and making friends was something I just never really excelled at. It didn't really have any direction that night, but I found myself leaning over the edge of the town bridge, staring down into the cold, dark abyss below. <clears throat> the fall may not have killed me, but I would have surely busted myself up on the rocks I knew lay below the surface, and being a weak swimmer would have likely drowned as I was swept downstream. I hoisted a leg over. I hoisted a leg over, almost robotically, and was in the process of hoisting another when a voice yelled out from behind, don't do it. I whipped my head around, and two high school aged boys were walking past on the opposite side of the bridge. They said it so casually, almost jokingly, probably not realizing my true intent. I forced a smile, almost embarrassed, and they continued walking. It was enough for me to snap out of whatever funk I was currently in and plant both feet firmly back on the bridge. Whatever I was intending on doing, I wasn't, about, <clears throat> I wasn't about to scar two innocent passers-by. I walked back to my apartment, went to sleep, and went back to work the following morning. A couple of sarcastic words having been all it took to save my life. Definitely not something I'm proud of nor have I told all but one other person, but it's one of those things that make you realize just how isolated our hardships make us feel, while in reality everyone faces their own, own internal struggles that we know nothing about. So in reality, we are far from alone. Thank you. the biggest hardship you've ever had to overcome? Not necessarily on the trail, just in general. Um, biggest hardship? Yeah. Um, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm pretty much an open book. Um, I lost my best friend in 2008. My best friend passed away, so that's probably the hardest thing I've ever experienced. You know, like, I've had, like, you know, grandparents and stuff pass, but your best friend, it's like, yeah. it's probably the hardest part for like a, I guess a lot of years, I like kind of on and off, like I had, um, I had an eating disorder for a long time. And so last year, right before the AT, I actually like things were kind of like, like at a really low. <laughs> and I like just, I like finally started like a, I started like an inpatient treatment thing and I dropped out of it cause it was really hard. And I, I, it, like, I was kind of like, okay, like what, <laughs> how am I going to, I felt like I kind of like exhausted all my options of getting how I was going to get over it. And that's when I heard that my friends were hiking the AT. So that, that's been my biggest obstacle to overcome. I had a uh, pretty life-changing injury. It was from a motorcycle racing accident. I, um, I was paralyzed for approximately six months as I was, I was in a wheelchair and um, just suddenly starting to be able to stand up. Uh, my left side started functioning again, which allowed me which allowed me to stand up, and um, 
my right side still kind of wishy-washy um, out here on the trail I actually kind of have a little bit of difficulty with it I don't have very much feeling on my right side so I do trip over a lot of things I have some difficulty walking um, but I, I've made it this far I would say my my parents divorce is pretty rough uh, I was just old enough to fully understand it and kind of watch it rip apart my family that was probably that changed me uh, more dramatically than anything I think especially at that age I think it was 13 12 or 13 um, yeah I look back on it now and think it's it was for the better uh, but yeah I think that was like I think I was a brat <laughs> before <laughs> before that divorce and uh, I think it really just shook everything to its foundation you know and uh, made me appreciate things more clearly. Oh, I suppose the loss of my dad, uh, you know, a loss of a real close family member. And he, your dad, uh, to me, my dad was the strongest man I've ever known in my life. And uh, to see him at his weakest point in his life, at uh, uh, the last week of his life, uh, is probably the toughest, uh, and it will be for anybody, to lose a parent or a, or a child, uh, for that matter. You know, uh, th thank God that hasn't happened to me. But uh, to, to a parent, I think I'd say my dad, yes. It's kind of a soul-searching adventure for me. Um, my mom was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's um, about six years ago. Um, so it's been kind of a rough journey, but I'm definitely learning a lot on trail about myself and uh, just growing as a human being and kind of accepting everything. And so it's it's been really helpful. It's been really great. I had a, I had a very difficult childhood. And for a long time, I operated on the same emotional level as I was when I was probably 12 to 14 years old. I let things affect me personally that uh, really weren't personal, and I felt like the world was against me and that nothing good was ever going to happen to me. And I started, I, I went into therapy and did all of these things to try to overcome that because it ruins your life, it ruins your relationships, it ruins your work uh, life, everything when you're reacting like a 16 or 14 year old girl and you're 30 something years old. And so, uh, like I said, I went to therapy to do that, but also um, giving things over to God has made a big difference to me and has... Uh, that's probably been the thing that has made my life as wonderful as it is. Now I see my life instead of, oh, poor unfortunate me who was a poor abused child and things. Now I see it's like I've had the richest life you could ever imagine and I have everything I could possibly want. I'm not rich. I'm not wealthy. But I have everything that I need. I'm secure and I'm happy and I have a beautiful family. And I just don't know what else I could have that anybody would want. And how do you overcome something like that? Um, you know, you just you put your effort into something else. Uh, mine went into my family. My I got four daughters, eleven grandkids. Uh, you know, there's a lot of effort put into that. And uh, uh, my wife, I, I love her dearly, and I, I put as much effort into her as I can. And you got to put that effort someplace, and you figure out where it is that you know that, that suits you. And I, I love my girls. I got four daughters, so I, I love them girls. I, more than life itself, so my energy goes into them. I think the biggest reason why I was able to overcome it was just kind of like rediscovering something that, like, um, I guess, like, outdoor, like, adventure has always been, like, a, a big thing and something really meaningful to me, and I think just, like, having that be, like, starting the Appalachian Trail and having that be, like, kind of everything that was... It was like I was, it was like, sorry, this is hard to say. Um, uh, I guess it's just I was inspired by life again. And that sounds really cheesy, but I think just being like, being inspired and being really excited and happy about something, like what I had tried to force, like I tried to really like force recovering and getting better and like, but I don't think I really had a, a great like inner reason to. And I feel like through hiking has given me something that I'm like that I really want to do and it and it just makes not having an eating disorder 
kind of like easy because <laughs> I'm excited about something, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It really changed my entire outlook on life, obviously. I mean, how could it not? And being out here on the trail, I think is just so much more definitely what I would want to do with this newfound ability to walk rather than just simply maybe sitting on a couch and watching TV. So I'm definitely much more conscious of how I live my life, how I spend my time, the activities that I engage in, the people that I engage in uh, after being able to recover from something like that, being sort of at my life's low, um, realizing how critical something like mobility is to a fulfilling life. And so I plan to use it to the fullest. And now that I am able to walk, I plan to do just that.
<laughs> we don't want to be on camera. We just want our peace and some of your blood. hardest thing for me is not like getting down on yourself when you have a bad day. Fuck. There's some days where things just don't quite go right, but again, those are the days I think are the are the funniest to me because they they're just so humbling. You're like, wow, nothing's going right today. This is ridiculous. And, so when. There are no river crossings, or no mountain climbing, or no snow to cross. You've got nosebleeds. This one was a pretty bad one. This is my fourth little napkin to try to wipe this stuff up. But man, first nosebleed of the trail. But hey, couldn't have had it at a prettier site. I like battling through all the challenges, no matter how crappy the situation is, no matter how down I am on myself, I know that if I keep pushing through that it's all gonna turn around, I'm gonna be happier when I come out of it. Mentally, sometimes you're just out there and you just, you do not wanna take another step. <laughs> and you gotta remind yourself, I'm out here, I have to keep going, like I'm not, I can't just stop because have this many days of food it's gonna take me this long to get to the next spot sure it's tough out there and you know every mountain you climb is oh this is miserable but you know I, I think you got to be goal-oriented and I think I am and, and uh, anybody that knows me real well knows that I'm pretty goal-oriented and I don't give up easy so I think what helps for me is reminding myself or at least convincing myself that the the pain is fleeting and that, you know, a stronger version of myself is on the way. And I just have to, I have to be smart and patient, you know. Know that, uh, you know, healing takes time and, you know, to get stronger just takes time. Your suffering uh, has a meaning because every now and then you, you reach a point of ecstasy and it fills you up. It, it, it you know, fulfills your soul, you figure out your place, and once you know your place, you can deal better with life. So, every time that you reinforce that 
positive aspect of hiking that, that this day went the way I wanted it to. You know, I did this many miles, which I wanted to do. That reinforces a, a sense of, of positive well-being in yourself, and it's just wonderful. It's like uh, every day you're doing something to make yourself feel like you're a, a success, and it just builds on itself. And even when you have bad days, we have a rule on the trail is that you do not quit on a bad day. And some people have even made it, I don't quit in a bad week, because sometimes you'll actually have a bad week. But on a bad day, that's the day that you say, well, I'm not quitting today. Today's just a bad day. And tomorrow may be a tremendously successful day. So you just keep going because every day you're reinforcing that positive feeling. And it's, it's, a, it's like a drug, kind of. <laughs> I think there's something therapeutic about just walking. There, there's just something about it. I, I don't know what it is, but it's anytime I, I, I'll have like a, a big decision to make or, you know, even if I have to have, you know, like a talk with somebody, I'll, I'll try to do it while walking. There's just something about it that, that kind of clears your mind. Um, and then you combine that with the fact that you're, you're out here, you know, you know, just, you know, beautiful place, kind of like a place where like people were meant to be, you know, um, I think that just kind of amplifies the effect. For me, one thing that I definitely notice is like, it's almost like, like everything is kind of like slowed down so like if you're if you if you're hiking and you're kind of in a in a bad mood or something comes up it's just like you know if you just like hike for another hour like you, your mood will change and everything changes and you can just kind of like watch everything like go up and down and like I find when I'm hiking I kind of like end up reflecting a lot on that being like okay like I'm feeling kind of like like down right now but it doesn't really matter because I just like regardless of how I'm feeling like all I have to do is just like get to the next water source. To do your best but then fail and then have to keep moving forward. I think that's something the trail can really teach people. What other choice do you have? You can just sit there, but it's not gonna help anything, you know? You gotta like look at the situation, figure out how to best move forward and, and, uh, and then do it. All right. Halfway done. Officially, pretty proud moment in my life. 1,325 miles. This way's Mexico. This way's Canada. So I'm this much closer to Canada. Sorry, this is like the only time I really get a look at myself. Looking at myself in the screen. Man, I look dashing. So, very dashing. And now me and my friend here, we are just enjoying the silence. <sighs> Taking in the day, joy is in the journey after all. In celebration of the midpoint, here's an animation of one of my many misadventures I wasn't able to capture on camera. Enjoy. Once upon a time in the mountains of central California, I awoke with a sudden urge festering deep in the pit of my stomach. If you catch my drift. I tumbled out of the warm confines of my synthetic tent into a chilly June morn and scrambled down into a five-foot pre-made cat hole dug out by an uprooted pine tree, and did what people do in such situations. Number two, going to the can, having a food baby, taking the Browns to the Super Bowl, etc., etc. When, snap, said a twig in the woods. What the funk, says I. Oh, snap, said another twig. Only this time, much closer, and way more disconcerting. I glanced up out of my five-foot cat hole, totally exposed in every way possible, and from the very edge of the hole, a pair of deep brown eyes peered down at me. Tall, dark, and handsome as he was, I found myself looking straight into the eyes 
of a cinnamon black bear. And no, this isn't another poop pun. I have never felt so exposed in my entire life. Pants down below my ankles, completely surrounded by earth, with nowhere to flee unless I got to digging that metaphorical tunnel to China. And even then, I'd have to go through some literal shit to even do that. A wave of fear flew through me, and I did the only thing any respectable person would do. I stood up, looked the bear right in the face, and yelled, Hey asshole, could I get a little bit of privacy here? My bear friend immediately grew wide-eyed, as one does when one accidentally happens upon someone in an embarrassing situation. He turned around and bolted deep into the woods. I, I am proud to say, squatted down to resume my business. The End Hey, my name's Sean Kennedy. I am hiking the last mile of California. And even though this state has been beautiful and gorgeous and breathtaking, it has also been a pain in my ass. So, I am ready to hit a new state. I may weep a little, may laugh a little, they do a whole lot of things when I get to the border. But, no buts, I'm ready. Ready to get out of this state. I love it. Sierras are beautiful, the desert was beautiful. Even northern freaking California was beautiful, as you can see. But, I'm ready for a new milestone. I've reached the halfway. I've reached Kind of got turned around here. Here we, here we go. We are about 15 steps from Oregon. I am in Oregon. And now I'm back in California. I'm in Oregon. I'm back in California. Those aren't tears, those are, those are, that's just sweat. Here's upgrade engineer coming up too. Finally, fuck you, California. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, man. We made it. Uh. <laughs> I can't even look. So, I found this mysterious cookie in the woods of Oregon. I wonder what'll happen when I eat it.
Have you ever thought about giving up? Oh yeah. <laughs> I think about giving up a lot, but then at the same time, it's just not an option. Have you ever thought about giving up? Oh, many times. And what stopped you? Uh, well, you know, it's like, well, you somehow get happy again. <laughs> I mean, it's like tiptoeing through the tulips in the morning and the baton death march in the afternoon. I guess there's just times when I, I think to myself, why am I doing this? You know, why, you know, I could, you know, talking about just taking time off and not having a job, you know, I could just be, you know, bumming around with friends or, you know, I could be working or, you know, there's, there's lots of cool things to do out there, you know, so I guess I've thought about that, you know, why am I doing this specifically, but there's just no way that I would quit. Have you ever thought about giving up? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Uh, I hurt my foot really badly in Tehachapi, and I thought that, you know, if it's going to be this hard, and if I'm always going to be thirsty and hungry and miserable and dirty, I, I, you know, I just don't think I can take it on top of an injury on top of all of that. But I'm curious. I want to know what happens next. And as long as I give myself enough time to recuperate, then I'll have the energy and the, the wherewithal to go on and see what else is there. If I don't see what else is there, I might regret it and I don't want to do that. You know, the only time I thought about quitting was day one. Day one was the emotional and physical low point. And I was always told or have been told that you cannot quit on your worst day. And I, I remembered that on my first day and I think that's what got me through it. There was a moment when I did consider quitting the trail. It was around mile 340, I believe, going into Cajon Pass. It was just outside of the Mojave Desert. It was about 109 degrees, I remember. And I, I remember sort of coming down this hill and I kind of made the decision, maybe this is it, maybe I should quit, because I was having a really difficult time. I was out of water, and I was hiking so hard, hiking so fast, I got there, and there was a big group of people who were pretty much in the same situation as me. They were hot, they were thirsty, and I just, I realized at that point that it, it, it wasn't just me. Everybody out here was kind of miserable, at least during that day. And so everybody's sort of communal misery, I guess, sort of made me feel included in this group. And I, I was, I, I couldn't stop. I, I had to keep going at that point. What kind of person do you think it takes to hike the PCT? All sorts. Yeah, I mean, I've met lots of people here and I don't think you could, there's a common thread runs through any of them, really. I think any kind of person, really. I think it's just, I don't think it takes any certain type. I think it's just the will. The will and desire to do it is all you really need. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter sex, gender. Even someone has a weak body, uh, but he has a strong mind, he can do it. I've seen a 15-year-old hike the whole PCT. I've seen a 72-year-old hike the PCT. I've seen people with massive blisters on their feet and just power through it. Anybody can really do it. It's just a matter of, uh, of, of uh, powering through it mentally. I think you also have to be super open-minded towards it because if you set out like I have to make it to Canada, the trail is going to throw things at you that you never expected. This may be my last entry. I'm going to try to cross this and um, 
just doesn't look good. So, I just want to thank you guys for watching. Here I go. I think if you don't have a burning passion to just see what you can accomplish, not compared to anyone else, just what can you do? I don't know that you can be successful. Definitely a person who has come out here for the right reasons. Um, their heart's in the right place. They're not simply following a fad. And I think you also have to be okay with just not really doing anything. You know, you're not always going to be occupied. You're not always going to have something to, to keep yourself from getting inside your own head. So if you're not okay with that, I, I think you can just go insane out here. This isn't what the shoe should look like. <laughs> We'll get there. A lot of people think we are crazy and that's the thing I would never do. And so for some people it's necessary. For me, for me, for me and myself, I would say, yeah, it's necessary to just make that experience. Everybody's got something unique in them. Is it a matter of drive or are some of these people just having a good time? Or, you know, it's like they have nothing better to do? I don't know. It's a really unique opportunity for anybody that does it and I think that they all like can look at this part of their life and think like I went and lived my craziest dream and I had all of these crazy experiences that I can share for the rest of my life and they all grow from it. I know a lot of my friends and I, we've talked about our past and some have had depression problems and they're like, I found hiking and it's absolutely my gateway to just being happy. You know, it's like I don't even have to try, I'm out here. You know, everything's so beautiful. Everyone you meet is just amazing. It's being more beautiful than I ever could have imagined it would be. I've met really great people. I've had a lot of fun. And you know, there's always ups and downs, but the ups are way, way more common than the downs. gives you a sense of not only purpose, but this, uh, this ability to take care of yourself in a way. To, you know, to wake up and make decisions and then uh, to deal with adversity as it happens. I wanted to do it because I wanted to see what I could do. I wanted to see, you know, I wanted to experience something totally different from my normal everyday life. This is about as different as it gets. I hope it leads me to just do the things I truly really want to do with my life. I think that's like probably the most important aspect for me is that I am learning to not listen to what other people say and just do like what I truly, truly want, and I think that was the trail for me, is doing something that the world doesn't expect me to do, and loving it. I saw United States of America in a light that no tourists see.
it's a good option for people to explore um, this country in a different way, you know. Instead of just going from town to town and, you know, and seeing the cities and seeing the sights and going to amusement parks and, you know, don't get me wrong, I like city culture as well. I love museums and such and things like that. But this is like a continuous natural museum for 2,000 plus miles. <laughs> I, I have grandchildren now, and how cool it would be to inspire them to plan something difficult, something really hard, and it's okay to do it. I totally believe that you know we were meant to be out here for some reason. Not only just to have a great time and just having that freeing experience, but you know, he has something out here that's gonna set a path for us after this. Throughout life, you gain some self-esteem, but here, this is like a factor of self-esteem. You just get it. You walk and you get it, you run into a snowstorm and you survive. And then you run into a mountain lion and you survive. And you're wet, you're miserable and you survive. In the end, you figure it out that, yeah, I did it. I don't think you walk 2,600 miles and not change in some way. I am on the home stretch. Only 80 miles left of this trail. But, unfortunately, it starting tonight at about 11, snow, then snow, then more snow, and even more snow after that, accumulating inches by inches by inches by inches. <laughs> so, uh, we'll see if I can actually get through.
it looks like this is it for me. Um, gone as far as I can go. Uh, I'm not, I'm not into the whole risking my life, the PCT type of thing. I've been seeing a few little avalanches going on. I've been hiking through some like knee deep snow. I've almost slid off a few times, lost myself a few times in the snow, couldn't find the trail. And I just don't think it's worth it. Right now, I can barely make out the trail as it is, and I don't want to wake up in the morning and be completely lost. My shoes are falling apart. I'm getting all sorts of snow in there. My rain pants kind of dissolved in the uh, dryer. I accidentally put them in the dryer, so they are they kind of fell apart on me. So um, my, my spare pants are all soaked. And I'm also wearing all my layers of shirts right now. And I know the top two are soaked. I'm pretty sure the bottom's soaked with sweat. Um, I've tried. I've made it to about 2595, which I think is pretty freaking excellent. 2500 miles, almost 2600 miles. <laughs> Can you believe that? Man. To think before this, the longest trip I've ever had was 35 miles. <laughs> that's that's freaking crazy. I have absolutely no regrets whatsoever. I've done what I've come out here to do. I've found myself. I'm happy with myself. I love myself. And that's something I just didn't do before. I didn't care about myself. I always relied on other people for happiness, but I found out I can do things on my own. I can live on my own, I can have fun on my own, I can laugh on my own. And that's important. That's the main reason why I was out here, to, to find myself, to find some peace, to really appreciate who I am, and come to terms with who I am. Like, be happy with everything about me. This guy has got me 2,600 miles on two feet that hate me, on legs that hate me, on a back that hates me right now. I mean, this whole trip's been rough, but rough in a good way. Like, I'd never replace any single moment of this trip. I feel like I am definitely a new person, a better person. And I want to share this person with the with the world. I know it, it takes a lot of strength and a lot of stubbornness and a lot of other things that other people have brought up in other interviews to make it to Canada, to be that person to get, who gets all the way to Canada. But I think it takes another equally strong and stubborn person to say, okay, I've had enough. I've done what I've come here to do and that's good enough. I can go home happy. I mean, it's, it is a tough decision. I mean, I'm only 50 miles away. I could push forward, but this just isn't worth risking my life for. There's a lot of things that I would gladly give my life for, but hiking a trail is not one of them. I can come out here one summer, just knock this off in a couple days, but for now, 2,600 miles out of a 2,650 mile trail, come on. If you have some qualms with that, you need to get a life. Preferably one where you hike a big long ass trail, because that is cool. Joy is not about the destination. Joy is about the journey. And I've had one hell of a journey to get to this point, to get right here. And I'm not going to cry over this. You see any tears in my eyes? This is not an emotional decision. This is a logical decision and <laughs> I'm happy with it. So I want you to find your own journey and your own happiness and don't focus on that destination. It's just the destination. I really don't know what else to say. <laughs> I think I'm gonna build myself a little 
makeshift snow monument, and then I'll be heading back. All right, love you all. Don't try.